Welcome to Global Harmonization Initiative webinar series. I'm Dr. Diana Bogiva, the GHI Working Group Director. It is uh, really my great pleasure to be with uh, all of you and our speakers and you, our audience. In today's webinar, we'll be uh, talking about uh, the food safety risk related to different food practices, including handling, storage, and hygiene requirements. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the GHI Food Safety Training and Education Working Group, which chairs Obadina Adewaye and Vice Chair Amelia Miteliu. Uh, thank you both for securing our speakers today. A group uh, focused uh, on the importance of education as a tool for meeting the right uh, food safety standards. Uh, this is what uh, GHI Food Safety and Training and Education Working Group is. And they especially promote uh, effective training uh, of food handlers uh, to minimize food safety risk by providing a harmonized perspective uh, of the present needs uh, of the global food chain environment. I'm really pleased to announce our excellent speaker today, uh, Caroline Smith Deval, a Deputy Chief of Eat Safe, uh, a Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, who engaged us into the vendors training with her talk, Delivering Food Safety for the Last Mile Vendor Training. And our second speaker is Dr. Nastasia Belk, uh, Director General at the Nutritional R&D Institute uh, for Food uh, Bioresources, uh, IBA Bucharest, and an Associate Professor at Faculty of uh, Biotechnologies at University of uh, Ergonomic Science and Veterinary Medicine in Bucharest, Romania. And she is also a member of Academy of Agriculture and Forestry Science in Bucharest, Romania. Dr. Belk will talk about uh, food safety for AU, a project focused on design, development and release of a multi-stakeholder platform for the future European food safety systems. And her talk uh, will be named uh, Food Safety for You, Challenges and Trend in Food Safety Community. Before we start, I wish to thank you our audience for joining us today and uh, we promise you it will be a great webinar with great discussions and you'll learn a lot from it. Also, I wish to thank ICC for providing us with uh, the platform uh, we are using for these webinars to reach you and also big thanks goes to GHI webinars team including uh, Dr. Nicola Stanley, our GHI communication director and Dr. Gerhard Schlenning. Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, be curious and ask as many as possible questions. Uh, you can place them at the Q&A section. Uh, we will make sure that uh, all of these questions are answered. And one announcement about our upcoming uh, second GHI World Congress on Global Food Safety and Security, which is going to be held from 18 to 20th of March 2024, next year in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, this international congress will explore the theme uh, stepping up the transition of the global food systems to a sustainable future and we welcome your abstract submissions on ghiworldcongress.org uh, you can see this uh, display in a chat so you can uh, record yourself uh, the name of the website let's start now with our webinar please welcome our first speaker today Caroline Smith Deval, Deputy Director from It's Safe. Caroline joined the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition in 2020 as a Deputy Director of It's Safe. Uh, prior to joining uh, uh, the Alliance, Caroline was the International Food Safety Manager at the United uh, States uh, Food and Drug Administration. Uh, she also served as an alternative delegate representing the United States at the Codex uh, Committee of Food Inspections and Certification Systems uh, and also participated on the United States delegation to the Codex Committee on Food Hygiene and the Codex Committee on Veterinary Drug Residues in Food. Caroline is a co-author of a um, uh, book, uh, Our Food Safe, a consumer guide to protecting your health and the environment. 
uh, published with Three River Press in uh, 2002, and he has been recognized as one of the most influential pe people on food safety by Food Quality Magazine for her work over the past uh, uh, 30 years on improving uh, food safety both in the United States and globally. Uh, let's welcome Caroline Smith Deval and her talk, Delivering Food Safety for the Last Mile Vendors Training. Over to you, Caroline. Diana, thank you so much. And um, thanks also to the Global Harmonization Institute for holding this webinar. We are going to spend the next probably 15 minutes talking about work that EatSafe is doing to facilitate the training of vendors in traditional markets. So EatSafe uh, is a program funded by the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development and Feed the Future. The aim of the work is to, is to facilitate food safety improvements in markets. Uh, and we're working currently in Nigeria, in two uh, states in Nigeria and in Ethiopia, in Hawassa, Ethiopia. We're a consortium of organizations. So we include ILRI, uh, Pierce Mill, uh, which is a, a, uh, an e education institute that does a lot of, um, it does videos and a lot, they're facilitating our radio show, and then the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. So in addition to the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, we have many partners on this work, and the work um, is only scheduled to continue until July 2024. Uh, so our interventions, I'm going to I'm going to spend most of the time talking about our work in Nigeria. I wanted to give you a, a sense of the scope of our work. Uh, we have four interventions that we're testing in these two states in Nigeria. One is the development of a stakeholder association that uh, stakeholders of these traditional food markets. It's called the Association for Promotion of Food Safety and Improved Nutrition. We also have a brand that vendors who are trained can participate in. Um, we have a safe food market stand, which is designed to help consumers learn more about food safety. We have people uh, trained uh, individuals who staff that stand every day and consumers can go and get information on food safety. And then there are a lot of demonstration projects. And then we have a radio show also. And we've been really interested to see how popular the radio show is. And, and it has a call-in component. And people actually spend a, a fair amount of time on the phone, sometimes calling in you know, 45 minutes or an hour before the radio show starts for the, to answer their question. Um, this slide is extremely complicated, so I am not going to go through it. Just, I want to give you a sense of kind of the complexity of working uh, in food safety generally, but also that it sits within this food safe, food systems framework. The areas that are circled are really where food, uh, food quality and safety live within these frameworks. And uh, there are different food systems frameworks. You, but you'll always find food safety kind of nested fairly low down in, in the, um, in the framework. But the, but as uh, food safety professionals know, food safety ha has to be considered at almost every nodule. Uh, and then nutrition and health outcomes is what we're seeking. And these all feed into our ability to, to meet the sustainable development goals of 2030. Now, EatSafe uh, did work to help really elaborate how food safety does fit within food systems. So here, I know we're going to be talking very soon about the training of vendors, but I wanted you to get a sense of kind of the complexity here, where this sits, 
and the importance of looking at the environment around food safety, consumers' attitudes uh, and knowledge, as well as uh, how the vendors are trained and how they handle the food within the market. Um, here, again, getting down further to where we're actually going to be talking is a, uh, a diagram that um, Eat Safe has developed to really show that the challenge of improving food safety in these traditional markets requires three elements or, or three legs of the stool. Uh, one is positive behavior change. Another is the enabling environment around the market. And the third are the best practices and technologies. So we know that uh, food safety food safety can be managed and accomplished through the proper programs and systems within a, for example, of a food processing facility. Uh, and those are well known um, G, uh, uh, good hygiene practices, HACCP systems, uh, and different record keeping or operational requirements. Um, but within a traditional market, those are much harder, those are much harder to come by. Those types of systems frequently don't exist. In addition, the, um, the actual infrastructure around the market is often lacking. Uh, I was going through photos preparing for this presentation yesterday, and, and there's a series from one of our markets where water is just flooding down the middle of the street, and people in the market are wading through it to do their to do the business in the market. So that's that makes um, clearly that makes food safety challenging as well as just getting ar around. And then finally, the area where we're working is in the knowledge, attitudes, and practices within the market and ensuring behavior change. So with that somewhat long wind up. Um, I'm going to turn to what I'm going to talk about mostly today, which are the lessons learned from vendor training in Nigeria. So training is foundational. I, I noted that we have four interventions that we are testing. We're piloting them, really. None of them were on training specifically in Nigeria. But what we found is that we literally could not do either the food safety stand or the brand without uh, a training component. And really, it's quite obvious that food vendors in operating in these markets are going to be a key audience as they source, handle, and sell food and food ingredients in the market. So our training has had two major components. We train the trainers. Uh, and these are both the staff working at the stand, but also uh, we've trained government officials, uh, other stakeholders that are part of our AFSAN program. Um, and then we have our training of vendors. So the next few slides I'm going to go through kind of think lessons learned. Um, our first lesson is that we need to know you need to know your audience. And the key issue here is what level of literacy the vendor do the vendors have. In most of our markets, we found that vendor literacy was below the the customer literacy because we did surveys of both uh, people who shop at the markets and the vendors. Um, so we have a letter a literacy level slightly below that of the uh, customers in the market. Um, the training really must be easy to understand for the intended audience. And it's also really important to consider the gender dynamics as you design your training program. Pay close attention to the trainee scheduling constraints. And I'll, I'll give an example later from our work in Ethiopia. But uh, that was our, our biggest complaint from training. Our first round of training is that we, we were asking vendors to literally be away from their stalls for too long and seek a training venue that's close to or in the market. 
This slide shows some of the changes we made uh, during the training program. We conducted our first training in August 2022 and our second uh, just last, last month in March of 2023. Uh, we transitioned from using a consultant to using Eat Safe staff with uh, in, inputs. We'd learned a lot from our training, our first training program, uh, and then we moved into the uh, using that knowledge to do the second training. In both uh, instances, we we were uh, training two cohorts, the train the trainers and the vendors. Um, we shortened the training significantly from three days to uh, one day uh, for grains and vegetables and two days for meat and fish, and then a day for Q&A across the groups. And we also shortened the time from an uh, really an eight hour day to four hours. And we worked with the vendors to decide what time of day worked and what days of the week worked best for them. Uh, we did use training manuals, both in Hausa and English and PowerPoints in both languages, especially for the second training. And uh, we similarly gave them materials to take notes. So our training design for our things that we learned, it is really key to communicate at, at the level and understand the existing knowledge, attitudes, and practices in the market. Those, we, de we determine those through a series of, um, of studies, formative studies that helped us understand really where where their current knowledge, attitudes, and practices were. And our objective really was to help vendors and consumers to develop new food safety habits. Our training plans describe the, both the training content, which is fairly standard across food safety, but I can share more on that in the Q&A if wanted our methods of training and our behavioral approaches and what how we wanted to impact them through habit, through the development of new habits. And importantly, trainers uh, need to utilize participatory training methods. This allows them uh, and the uh, vendors themselves to practice their, to practice the new behaviors that we're teaching. And it's especially important for low literacy trainers. Next, uh, we ask them to uh, communicate that food safety is really a shared responsibility among all actors. There isn't blame here. There isn't fault. We're not putting the vendors in, in an uncomfortable position. We're showing, though, that their role in keeping the food safe is vital. Uh, and so that that communication about the shared responsibility really helps um, helps keep people open to hearing what the key messages are. Uh, we also use methods that engage their emotions and senses, and this helps to give them the why. Why should I change my habit? I've been doing it this way for 30 years, 20 years. So we need to give people the motivation and the um, and the why for why they're going to to make a change. And habit formation also builds on their existing practices. So again, knowledge of those existing attitudes and practices is very helpful uh, and really vital to understand how we can help them build on existing habits, not uh, just have to create new ones. What was most interesting to me is even as we had problems around timing and, you know, have, keeping people away from their vending stalls for eight hours, which a lot of vendors didn't like. And, you know, we had some some negativity at the end of our tr first training that we changed as a result. One thing that um, I found very interesting is even with that, the vendors were very enthusiastic to receive additional food safety training. Even after the first round, they knew that they wanted more information. And so you'll find an audience that's very willing to engage in training, to participate if it's designed properly to meet their needs.
And then um, finally, the the materials, you really need to design materials that are fit for purpose. And again, looking at the needs of the vendors here, uh, the combination of 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 making sure that it's in a language, the, the language they understand. So you can't conduct the trainings just in English. You really need to be using good materials that are translated uh, and then use training methods that engage them. So that we did that through visits to the market, uh, a lot of demonstrations, which actually are continuing in the uh, with the food safety stands in Nigeria, they hold periodic demonstrations. Uh, this is one I think on handling meat and keeping it cool. Um, storytelling, question and answer sessions. These are all really important for engagement of the vendors. Um, that is my last slide on training in Nigeria. And as I mentioned, we've held two rounds of training. We have uh, we're conducting our uh, final survey of vendors to determine, you know, what they thought of our training. But our first round, they were extremely uh, supportive of. They thought in our first round, they they said the vendors said that they thought it would help their businesses and keep their customers safe, which is exactly where we want them thinking. That gives them the motivation. So we have a training pilot, uh, a specific training intervention we're piloting in Ethiopia. And here we're using um, students from Hawassa University to go in and do biweekly training of uh, the vendors in the markets. They are training a smaller group of vendors and they're doing it right at the stalls or, or at a location that's not very far from, from the vendor's stalls. The training, the vendors have asked that the training be no longer than 30 minutes. So that's a big difference from our training, our, you know, our two day or three day training in Nigeria. Uh, we have to package it into these 30 minute modules. And uh, we have seven modules at this point that we plan to train on. And each module includes both a discussion section and an, and a demonstration section. Um, so here, uh, there, and each module also has um, things that we're sh giving to them, sharing with them in order to ensure that they can practice, they can do the practices in, at their stall. Uh, an example here is a soapy, a soapy water bottle. Uh, where you fill a bottle with um, soap and clean water, and you can use that throughout the day uh, to keep your, it's contained so it doesn't get uh, contaminated, but you can use it through the day to wash your hands and to wash surfaces. And then finally, we're focused on um, these messages around the five cleans and the four safes. So clean hands, clean water, clean tools, clean surfaces, clean clothes and cloths. And then safe storage of the food, sorting, safe sorting helps to maintain the, the highest quality food, um, separating from meat products. So keeping uh, vegetables and meats and, uh, separate in the market and then sanitizing. And that is that is it for me. So, Diana, thank you so much for um for inviting me to participate, and I, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Caroline. This was quite interesting. Uh, obviously, a food quality and safety framework, as you said, is quite complex. Um, uh, but uh, how national and international organizations uh, work uh, and uh, food law is executed? This is one of the questions that our audience is asking. So, um, food law, is a national is is generally managed at the national level but um many countries use the advice of the codex alimentarius in designing their systems so we do have international um standards for food safety that then are applied at the national level the challenge that we've had with traditional markets is that the um, traditional markets uh, are 
are managed at the local level. So it's like one level or two levels down. Um, and, and a lot of traditional markets aren't regulated at all. That's been a big issue. Um, but the bottom line for the vendors is they don't actually want more regulation. It's really more of a um, activity that they want, they want help. They want um, assistance. So they don't, it's coming in with a large enforcement body would not really help us here. It's really about giving the vendors and the market authorities enough um, enough uh, resources to improve in, uh, to improve our infrastructure and to manage food safety, facilitate food safety in the market. Mm. How all these uh, food safety practices uh, correspond to the scope of small scale food industries? I think that you are dealing with this small scale, even traditional markets, owners, vendors. Yeah, and GAIN is unique in spending most of its time working with small and medium enterprises. So food vendors are really at the very, you know, the very nub of that. Um, they're the very smallest in a way. Um, the vendors, um, the vendors choose food market, you know, to vend at the market, usually because it's easy access. It's like something if you need to get money for your fan to support your family, you can go be a food vendor. So um, it's something that is 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 often done as people are moving up the economic scale. Um, Gain has been working though with uh, both these from these vendors all the way up to you know the small and medium enterprises, the the uh, organizations that source food and provide food to the markets, um, and we also work in food fortification. So that's with even larger enterprises. So Gain spends a lot of time working in the private sector. But with the, our core mission is uh, ensuring um, improving nutritional quality of the food that uh, consumers in these in the countries where we work operate, you know, this to ensure that they get the highest nutritional quality um, uh, for the food that they can get. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, you need to know your audience really well. Their literacy level needs to be considered and things. Uh, which were the major hurdles uh, you were facing uh, when you were training them? Um, just uh, to, to our audience to visualize these hurdles. Can you give us a concrete example? What was the most difficult practice to be learned to be agreed, to be implemented, anything that uh, you can share with us? The, um, I think some of the biggest challenges are around, uh, you know, how to make sure they have clean water. So yep. most of our training are things that the, uh, that they can, ex that the vendors can have control over and can execute themselves. Um, I went in as part of the formative research for this project. I went in and looked at um, global guidance for how to manage food safety in traditional food markets. And interestingly, four regions of the codex have already like set out standards for markets in the region. So there's a lot of information. Um, the the hygiene practices of vendors is, are, of course, very important, but sensitive. You know, you need to you need to share what are good hygiene practices with the vendors um, in a way that that is culturally sensitive and where that where, again, people we want people to adopt those habits. Um, the. Uh, you know, food handling, that makes sense to the vendors because like how they handle the food, yeah. of course, is going to be important for their business and customers often can see that. So the thing that became more challenging is how to encourage vendors to manage conditions in the market. Yeah. When there's when waste, there's not good waste management, when the water sources aren't clean, when there aren't adequate sanitary facilities, bathrooms in the market, um, and hand washing facilities. And during COVID, of course, some of the markets um, 
put in like separate hand washing, both for vectors and consumers, you know, but that was, uh, those are now te more temporary measures, but we need to make them, they, they need to be part of the basic infrastructure of the market. So again, that three-legged stool I showed you, we can't just address knowledge, attitudes, and practices. That's only going to get us part of the way. It's an important part. But we need yeah. to address the infrastructure uh, and give also vendors the technologies that will help them. Yeah, there are lots of questions coming up. Uh, so uh, people were uh, like a uh, person from our audience is thanking you for the insights into food vendors training in Nigeria. Uh, how can the training be sustained and expand? Um, uh, okay, one second, because uh, yet to other parts of the country, how can the existing environmental health officers contribute to achieving safe food supply? So um, sustainability and expansion is a key objective. Um, our program will will be ending uh, in the next year. So we do really need to make sure we've got some efforts in place. I think our 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 uh, the way we hope to do that in Nigeria is through the Association for the Promotion of Safe Food and Improved Nutrition. We already have other states. We have we have it set up in two states, and then other states uh, have expressed interest in Nigeria. Um, this will that that organization may adopt um, and take on the training uh, job. Uh, from Eat Safe. So we're very excited about that. And how can extension officers help? Oh, that's like a wonderful question. And we want um, extension could also be really, the, really involved. And this is local or state extension departments could be really involved in doing vendor training. Eat Safe is happy to, to share our knowledge and our materials um, will be sharing them with the U.S. Agency for International Development, certainly at, as we uh, finish our program, but we will be really excited to share them uh, with others. Uh, there is uh, uh, one opinion uh, for uh, a person about also Nigerian problems, with the, uh, particularly with Nigerian traditional markets which uh, have lack of facilities provided by the government, no clean water, unpaved roads, uh, no cooling room for unsalted meats uh, and vegetables, no proper stalls, uh, inadequate toilets. Uh, food vendors are ready to observe safety, but the conditions are very poor. Uh, what, uh, you know, could be done, uh, these conditions to be improved, probably talks with the government, talks with any other institutions. So what are you doing in this direction? So um, Eat Safe has had, uh, has worked extensively with stakeholders at all levels. So we, AFSAN is an example of how we're working with stakeholders locally to improve the, the traditional markets. But we also have brought traditional markets to the attention uh, of the national government. Uh, we're, as they've discussed changes in legislation, we want to make sure the informal sector is covered uh, in that national legislation. We are also working in codex, which will bring to the attention of many national governments the need for a focus and improved standards for traditional markets. So we're really working internationally, nationally, and at, at the local level in the states where we're currently operating. Yeah, there, there are more questions. So uh, I will say one more, and after that, uh, we will pass to um, next to our next speaker and at the end we will answer the rest of the question. So uh, this person is saying, I noticed the training was held in the northern states only. Could there be a reason why it's just the northern states or are other intentions to select some other non-northern states to be reached in Nigeria? So people are interested uh, your service to be, uh, you know, kind of expanded. 
We would love to be in every state in Nigeria, and we have a really um, strong Nigerian uh, low, uh, program uh, led by um, Dr. Augustine Okamura. Um, we are we have we are very anxious to to expand through the use of the association. Um, so we would really recommend that people reach out. Uh, with questions about how to get the association for the promotion of food safety and improved nutrition into their states, because that will help uh, facilitate the stakeholders getting together. Adding to the previous question, there is another person that is also talking about the same things and especially talking about Southwest West region. Uh, there is the Bodija market in Abadan, Oyo State and some other major markets in Lagos State uh, and other states vendors really need food safety training in this part of the country as well. So a uh, lot of interest. Please, um, if you're in our audience, interested to be in contact with uh, uh, Caroline and uh, her organization, uh, please uh, send us an email so we can make the connection. Uh, so, Thank you very much for now, and we'll continue now with uh, our next speaker. Thank you. Which is, thank you, Caroline. Uh, we will talk to you in uh, later with more questions. Uh, so our second speaker is Dr. Nastasia Belk, a Director General at the National R&D Institute. Uh, she's a food senior scientist and uh, also an associate professor at the Faculty of Biotechnologies uh, within the University of Agronomic Sciences and Veterinary Medicine in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, she's also a member of the Romanian Academy for Agricultural and Forestry Sciences. Uh, um, Nastasia is involved as a member in several advisory boards, such as uh, Consultative Council for Research, Development and Innovation under the Ministry of Research, Innovation and Digitalization, a consultative uh, council of sustainable development department under Romanian government and also scientific council of uh, sanitary veterinary authority and food safety. Nastasia Belk uh, is um, also member of the accreditation council of uh, national accreditation body RENAR and president of two standardization committees edible seeds and foods. Uh, the rest of uh, her biography you can see on our website. Let's welcome Dr. Nastasia Belk and her talk, Food Safety for You, Challenges and Trends in Food Safety Community. Over to you, Nastasia. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you very much for inviting me and for uh, this nice presentation. And, uh, of course, I will uh, start with challenges in food safety. And uh, I start a little bit with... Uh, with uh, probably a knowledge that are already known, but uh, only to remind it and only to to uh, to try to relate these two parts uh, to see the trends for the next uh, future uh, uh, food safety community. So we speak about food safety, but we speak also about sometimes for, about food integrity. So I can give a, a definition of food integrity. The state of being whole, entire, or undiminished, or in perfect condition in terms of quantity and quality, hygienic, nutritive, sensorial, speaking the food. But uh, uh, we, we know that food system that we name now in the last year, food system, uh, is very complex uh, and uh, need Food safety integrity needs a multidisciplinary approach uh, based on microbial and chemical food safety, authenticity of origin, frauds, which be also related with uh, food safety, and of course, quality. So we, uh, we need to have safe food, healthy, tasty, but at the same time, sustainable to have care about animal, uh, correct labor. So, for this, all of this, we need to have some uh, new developments, research, because I am working in the food research area. And when we were now about food safety, we know that food safety is not negotiable. 
because it's related with health with so, uh, and socio-economical reasons. So it is a complex issue and is very costly, but uh, we need to have it because it depends our our life, our health, it depends on food safety, but also our safety envi environment and animals and plants. Food, uh, food safety crises are not a thing uh, of the past. We could see even now a lot of foodborne diseases or, uh, all over the world. And uh, according to, to uh, European foods, for example, we can have also some fraudulent label imitations so, uh, uh, that sometimes are related with uh, food safety. I uh, have a little bit of history here. In 2008, Atkins has discussed that in Europe, uh, food scares have been with society, for example, in the UK, uh, since uh, 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 100 years ago, or uh, other researchers mentioned that only in Europe, foodborne illness affects about 1% of population each year, and also uh, in uh, uh, United States, also a lot of illness are related to uh, food, uh, approximately 60.7% uh, of population. So we have still this kind of cases, food crisis, and I give here some example about uh, crisis from the last uh, 10 years, I think, about uh, dioxin in eggs, about uh, some uh, uh, sprouting uh, uh, Escherichia coli infected uh, uh, food, also melanin in milk, but not only. And uh, uh, we know about the crisis about uh, horse meat in uh, some foods. But uh, uh, all, uh, at that time, I remember uh, horse meat, uh, for horse meat, uh, uh, it was said that it's not about food safety, but it is about food safety because if the, that meat was not verified, about hy hygienic and quality properties, so it could be some food safety issues there. So uh, what affects food integrity in which food safety is uh, integrated also? Microorganisms, chemical pol pollutants, and also bad food production processing practices, including frauds. About microorganisms, uh, we can speak about the uh, microbial, microbial ecology of the food chain. Here we can mention biodiversity behavior, as um, uh, it was said before, uh, persistence of microorganisms, uh, also molecular biology of emergence, survival and pathogenity, and also use the advanced uh, technology. About chemical pollutants, we speak. We can speak about allergens existing in food uh, because they have a very severe effects when they are there. So new and unexpected toxicants or overdoses chemical ingredients or new and unexpected effects to different substances. We know that foods has the uh, capacity to accumulate chemical substances from, from the environment. And it, in this way, uh, the health of uh, human health is influenced by exposure. So the chemical contamination is a widening phenomenon. It, it's continuing expanding, but toxicity of, of chemical depending on quantity and periodicity, synergies and antagonists between other chemical substances, but more there are some processes of bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Bioaccumulation means that uh, an organism absorb toxic substances at a rate greater than at which the substances is lost. So it's accumulated but is not lost enough. And biomagnification is a result of the process of bioaccumulation and biotransfer on the uh, trophic level. I, I made here uh, a scheme about what kind of uh, contaminants can uh, be in food. There are many others, but I put only as, as I, an image, a picture to see uh, that a lot of substances get can uh, contaminate our food from uh, 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 
ag agricultural processes, from uh, uh, food processing, from environments, and for uh, different treatment. We know that the uh, International Agency for Research in Cancer classified some uh, substances as carcinogenic to humans, probably carcinogenic, possibly, uh, or not classifiable. There are an international classification and a new classification, and uh, I pointed out here some uh, uh, in red, as you see, uh, some uh, components that are very, very uh, dangerous for human health. Uh, uh, for example, dioxins uh, that are very, very um, harmful in very, very slow quantity, and uh, they are uh, occurring uh, uh, during different um, um, uh, different processes, uh, special uh, when uh, we burn uh, leaves. Uh, backyards or uh, uh, in uh, uh, different uh, fire uh, uh, wood or fire forest or uh, so different kind of uh, processes, industrial processes can um, uh, release dioxins that is very much accumulated because the uh, uh, their uh, remanence is very very high, uh, hundred years on the soil. Also, uh, we speak about heavy metals, cadmium or arsenic or aflatoxin from uh, 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 as mycotoxin from fungi. Uh, these are very uh, are uh, uh, clearly carcinogenic for human, but uh, also others uh, that you can see here in the list. Speaking about heavy metals, uh, they are transferred via the food chain, of course, and um, they induce uh, different toxic effects in consumers, uh, are polluting, uh, they are uh, polluting the air, the soil, and they are coming from different uh, human activities. Uh, the main hazard from heavy metals are associated with lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic con uh, contamination. And for example, for mercury, the people are primarily exposed by, via fish, uh, uh, especially shark, swordfish. We have also benzene, which is not so dangerous, but dangerous enough because it's ubiquitous uh, in atmosphere. We can find anywhere uh, uh, because of uh, cars, no, because of uh, uh, other activity, human activities. And uh, I found the uh, five years uh, study funded uh, by U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and they found uh, uh, benzene in 40 types of food. Or packaging material, chemical hazard, we speak in the last years more about this because uh, they are coming with different substances that are uh, also harmful. And I can uh, uh, mention bisphenol A, which is an industrial chemical widely used in production of uh, plastics. And uh, these plastics are used in food contact as food, food contact materials, for example, baby bottles and food containers. And we know a, a, a lot of discussion was, was about uh, uh, bisphenol A. And uh, also uh, we could uh, say that uh, consumers are exposed to bisphenol A via the diet. Uh, also, we have uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, there are most widespread organic pollutants, are lipophilic substances. We can find them in soil, sediment, fossil fuels, and uh, um, in natural crude oils and uh, coal deposits. And uh, also, we can uh, uh, find in uh, our food uh, grilled, barbecued, or smoked fish. We can mention also agrochemicals because we, we think to be, we know that a lot of strategies are in reducing this kind of substances and because they are contaminate the food raw materials and here important uh, are good agricultural practices, not uh, uh, have uh, higher doses that it is recommended, but 
Anyway, after decades of heavy industrial activities and the intensive use of these substances, the environment in some area in the world are polluted with different mixture of chemical compounds. And even now, for example, uh, DDT was, uh, uh, I think, was banned somewhere in at uh, in 70 or uh, in the early 80 years. But even now, there are there is found some uh, traces of this compound, which is very persistent. So uh, uh, these are very toxic substances. They are cause potential adverse uh, health effects. And in Stockholm Convention, uh, which, uh, it was an international treaty for protecting human health and the environment of uh, these kind of compounds. Romania uh, also uh, uh, ratification uh, entered in, into the force in uh, 2005 in this uh, uh, international treaty uh, uh, agreed to, to reduce uh, also the agrochemicals in, uh, in using uh, in uh, agriculture. And uh, we know that uh, the new uh, policies, European policies, are, uh, uh, have seen this, uh, this um, process in reducing the agrochemicals as much as possible, of course. We have nitrates, nit nitrates and nitrosamines. The nitrates, we are not, they are not so dangerous, but they are used as fertilizer in high quantity. And sometimes, we, we use also in food industry, especially in meat processing, that they are easily transforming into nitrates, and these are transforming into nitrosamine that are very dangerous. So when there are in, in large quantity, we have a problem, especially that uh, plants, for example, are not uh, absorbed all the quantity of nitrates and nitrates remain in the soil then in water and the uh, uh, water is uh, uh, very rich in nitrates and we have nut nutrification uh, uh, kind of process that uh, uh, we know uh, water are covered by different herbs and uh, this uh, suffocated the fauna so there is a cycle and that these nitrates uh, in using being used in high quantity could also destroy the environment, but also um, you know, could participate to uh, nitrosamine formation. I spoke before about dioxin that are almost uh, over 400 types of dioxin related compounds, but about 30 of them are very, very toxic. So we, I, I, I saw, uh, I already said that they are pro, uh, found throughout the world in the environment, and more than 90% of human exposure is done by food. But uh, what I want to mention, not to, to read everything, but uh, to uh, tell you that uh, their half life in the body is estimated to be seven to 11 years. So it's a very persistent uh, contaminants and cancerogenic. So it's very dangerous for human health. I uh, uh, wrote here about uh, different uh, effects that uh, dioxin could produce in human body, but because of extreme toxicity of uh, dioxin at European and international level, particular attention is paid to monitor the level of dioxin uh, both in the environment, uh, water, air, and soil, and of course in the foodstuff. And I can uh, say that we also did some uh, some uh, experiments in our uh, in our institute, and we found uh, in eggs, also in meat, uh, not uh, exceeding the level uh, uh, permitted. But uh, for example, in ecologic eggs, we found more than in the other eggs because. Uh, the other ex, uh, uh, the feed of uh, of uh, birds was controlled in ecologic uh, uh, so or in rural area. 
uh, eggs coming from rural area, the feed is not so uh, uh, well controlled. So we could find dioxin, but fortunately not exceeding the uh, limit level. Uh, dioxin cannot be destroyed through preparation to processing, so there are not metabolized but by uh, in organisms. Usually, they are accumulated in uh, in uh, uh, fat tissue, uh, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, during <coughs> sorry seven or eleven years can be uh, uh, excreted. For example like source can be volcanic eruption, forest fires, leaves, backyard burning, so uh, different uh, <coughs> burning processing that uh, coming from human uh, activities. Although formation of dioxin is local, environmental distribution is global. I put here a table of different incidents uh, about uh, dioxin contamination, starting with uh, 76 till uh, 2010 here in this table. <coughs> but what is important that we could uh, find dioxin in milk, butter, beef, veal, in poultry, in eggs, so especially in animal origin uh, uh, food in which there is a fat and uh, in fat uh, dioxin is accumulated. But we have also included in food integrity food fraud. But personally, I think also food fraud can be very easily associated with food safety because it's about substitution, addition, tampering, simulation, mislabeling, misbranding. For example, if we found uh, a food on the shelf in the, in the shop uh, which is contaminated, I consider that is a, a food safety issues. It's a food fraud because a contaminated food couldn't be in a shop. So we should prevent to be in a shop uh, this kind of food. So, uh, and it is a food fraud because we know that uh, all uh, the food should be examined uh, before to be sold. <clears throat> uh, I uh, put here um, an example of melamine in uh, dairy products. And uh, uh, we, I put an example from New Zealand, but in Europe was uh, the same uh, situation in one year. Uh, what I want to say about uh, uh, all this issue considering food safety, we should have a systemic analysis approach from farm to fork. So we should have a risk benefit analysis to have a holistic method, maybe something more than HACCP, which is only in the processing area. Of course, there are good agricultural practice, good manufacturing practice, good hygienic practice, but prevention is the main word for uh, uh, related to it food safety, because otherwise we can find the food contaminated, but uh, we lost the raw materials, we lost the resources, energy, water, and we lost the food in fact. So the prevention, I think, is the most uh, uh, important in this process. <clears throat> also, uh, prevention is related with traceability. Uh, uh, but food traceability, we know, be, uh, uh, offer a high potential for consumer protection by targeting precisely the recall, eliminate the non-consumable food products and promoting the investigation of the causes of food safety issues. But I, I say again, okay, traceability is once, we should uh, prevent uh, not uh, food contaminated to, to be uh, to the consumer, but also to prevent contamination from the beginning. So over the last 20 years, food production has changed tremendously, making agrochemicals, chemicals additive, drugs for, for treatment needed 
at, at the time, but uh, prevalent in the food we eat today. So uh, we we should probably we should take have another approach, as I said before, preventing, trying to reduce agrochemicals, chemical additives, but finding at the same time solutions in order to have a uh, shelf life for the food to protect the plants to treat the animals but in more sustainable way and consumers should know uh, what is in their their food so we start from labeling uh, and there are a lot of controversy uh, regarding labeling how much consumer wish to know about the uh, product they buy the time consumers have to receive the information the space available for all information so there are a lot of discussion in this but uh, uh, they should choose the food uh, uh, according with their needs so they should uh, be informed about what it is inside, if the food is from conventional agriculture, from, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 organic agriculture and different kind of production, production they to choose, in, uh, uh, they to know how to choose and uh, to maybe, if they know, they can uh, uh, um, help support more transformation of food system in an one sustain, in a sustainable uh, food system, what we want for uh, for the future. As a conclusion for the this first part, food safety is part of society of our society. Uh, firstly, <clears throat> great societal challenges are related, connected to food safety. Uh, so. Firstly, to, uh, to have a reduction in post-harvest spoilage. Then to have special foods for special needs with uh, functional properties, novel ingredients, but keeping food safety at the same time. Then foods to be unspoiled and safe free from chemical contaminants, from pathogen, from toxic substances, to, to have convenient and ready to eat foods, but also foods that can be stored several days or even months, but in sustainable way. And um, last but not least, consumer education is very important, even if uh, after they uh, buy the food and go at home and how to consume, how to not con cross-contaminate, to put no, as uh, Caroline said before, uh, not put uh, uh, meat and uh, vegetable together uh, on the table, uh, uh, not to make possible cross-contamination in our home. About trends in food safety, uh, and developments in food safety community, I want to speak about our project at the European level, which was start with idea to global food system transformation, but of course, having as the basis the European policies, European Green Deal, Farm to Fork, uh, European Initiative Food 2030, and uh, uh, all of this uh, give us uh, uh, idea that uh, uh, it's uh, needed for a transition, uh, so transforming the food system safely towards increased sustainability at the same time. But what is needed is needed collaboration, cooperation, alignment in different countries. Of course, we need funding for the, all of this. So we should address the complexity of food system, as I said uh, from the beginning, because we have uh, societal challenges, we should have a systemic approach, and we should uh, have the consumer trust uh, put in place new technologies, data management, interoperability of data, because there are in Europe there are a lot of data <clears throat> which should be used in an efficient way, and also transparency of food system. <clears throat> Our project is a funding scheme uh, uh, coordination support action, 3 million uh, euro project for three years. 
we are 23 uh, orga research organization and other more 50 supporting partners. And our goal is to develop a platform of food safety system actors and activate a structured participatory process to make effective their collaboration, thus providing digital knowledge and tools and competencies as a service for European Commission and European Food Safety Authority. <clears throat> Sorry for... Uh... So uh, our um, uh, objective, strategic objective are three. To have a food safety system integrate by facilitating the dialogue for promoting research uh, and innovation and policy coherence. Also to have a participatory process with all uh, food safety system stakeholders to exploit synergies and capabilities between countries and region. Another uh, strategic uh, objective is to co-create and align research programs in all European countries by guidance for modifying and alignment joint transnational research programs and co-create a new food safety strategy. Uh, then to enhance public confidence by improving communication and risk assessment, by uh, having new approaches to engage civil society and to have scheme to guarantee open access to the available resources. Uh, we have three, uh, uh, three uh, pillars for including, firstly, to including different stakeholders from food safety system, European and not only, to shape this platform that I said before, uh, multi-level, uh, multi-stakeholder platform, and uh, to, to design a new strategic research and innovation agenda at European level, and with uh, uh, established term of reference, to uh, uh, use this platform and in benefit of all food safety system stakeholders, but also to have an uh, annual EU food safety uh, forum to discuss all the hot issues in food safety and also to uh, update the, our uh, strategy, to update our, our action plan for the next uh, future. So the platform starting with stakeholder engagement. We uh, have had some social labs and uh, uh, in the frame of uh, uh, for future policy and uh, uh, we, as I said before, we will design a European Food Safety Forum, annual uh, Food Safety Forum, uh, and also to have models for public confidence, for communication, we wanted to design this platform uh, in, the, uh, in the benefit of all food safety system stakeholders. Uh, we identified seven uh, categories of stakeholders, but grouped in three level, macro level, meso level and micro levels. In mas, uh, macro level, there are um, uh, authorities, uh, meso level research and academia and micro level uh, business and uh, we we want it to, uh, to be targeted to knowledge dissemination and communication to networking supporting opportunities to grow and to access of different kind of experts and stakeholders only to see that we identified some value proposition using the model canvas business model canvas starting from the needs of stakeholders, starting from their pain, their fears, starting about from what they want to gain. And then we, in the left part, we identify what is needed we to be done through the platform in order to meet their uh, uh, requests. In this way, we can see that uh, we, uh, through this platform, we consider to have a single central space and access for all food safety system stakeholders uh, in which we, they can be trained. 
there, there will be e-learning processes, interaction and cross-learning, guidance and understanding and using of data information. Also, we will share continuous different uh, materials, best practices, uh, updated trends, different various topics to be discussed in our forum. Uh, also, to get in touch and support them in different projects and to give solutions and also to give them uh, to the stakeholders updated and reliable information, data and knowledge. And uh, we uh, um, did a platform governance, uh, defined our mission, our values, our objectives to, to keep in mind our partners, contributor infrastructure and design. I cannot, I will not read uh, now, but what I want to say is that um, um, uh, we uh, uh, want to be in the benefit of food safety system stakeholders and uh, uh, stakeholders also can contribute to our platform with different best practices, with different uh, view approaches in order to uh, improve our uh, food system, uh, safety system at European level at least. But of course, we can act uh, with, uh, in supporting other partners from uh, other uh, continents. In our platform, we will have also some digital apps for uh, research apps in order to find different uh, funding opportunities for documents and info sharing, for communication, uh, also website, of course, but uh, we will have a risk assessment task. But what is important at the beginning, expert finder apps, which already started to function in our website. Uh, the platform in the second part of the year will be opened and uh, uh, it will be presented in our forum, which will be in November this year, at the end of November and the uh, first forum uh, and uh, uh, we will present also our strategy. Uh, you can see here uh, our uh, 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 place for registering experts, experts uh, all of them that are working in the food area and it is a place for communication, for cooperation, for collaboration. You can enter and uh, also, we say, we wrote here for the beginning, we wanted to, to uh, organize forum in December. Just in the last uh, month, we, uh, we uh, uh, moved for November because at that date in December, there are a lot of a lot, another meetings, important meetings, and uh, we wanted not uh, people to, to uh, wanted to choose. Uh, in different kind of meeting. And we already uh, defined the, uh, the, I don't know, the wide section, the uh, sections of our, uh, our uh, uh, research agenda, strategic research agenda. And it was uh, open, wide open consultation with a lot of uh, stakeholders, over 300 from uh, uh, Europe, and we defined, for example, one of uh, topic climate change and food safety. And here we found nine uh, topics in which we wanted to have some actions in the next future. So about uh, climate change influences contaminants, uh, also developing new approaches methodology and domics for regulatory risk assessment. I give some example also. Uh, only new business models, standards and logistics, interaction between food contaminants and microbiota, for example, uh, or uh, including soil microbiome, which is very important in risk assessment. Soil, it's a very important movement now in Europe in order to be restored, to be improved, because, of course, is one of the one of the most important resources for uh, agri-food uh, resources. The second uh, uh, topic, uh, wide topic, it's about food supply chain, traceability and transparency. Here I give example only two, there are other many, increasing, for example, food chain transparency 
through blockchain technology and digital solution or digital system for online data on agricultural site stream and OSTs. Another one is integration, improving risk assessment methodology. I give also some example, integrate chemoinformatic and bioinformatic approaches technologies or uh, <clears throat> new harmonized approaches to systemically collect, analyze and interpret data at EU and uh, national level. Also toxicology and the assessment of uh, chemical safety in humans, human biomonitoring, predictive and modeling tools and innovative risk assessment methodology. As I said, there are other many. I put it only as example. Another wide topic is rapid technological advancement and emerging technologies with new genomic te techniques, with the development of new natural food additives or cellular agriculture, for example, precision fermentation, indoor cultivation, Sustainable food production and processing covering the 12th sustainable development goal, for example, food waste recovery, new cleaning processes and procedure, new packaging solution. I uh, uh, spoke about uh, packaging affecting food safety, uh, new multidimensional tools and methods for packaging optimization. And very important also ethics and one health systemic approach, which is a systemic approach to put in the middle human health and surrounding environment, uh, plant and animals, no health. And here uh, we wanted to focus in ecology of the emerging pathogen or um, I give another example, developing risk assessment approaches to address sustainable food system and one health or uh, mapping of food bioresources, nutritional security and new protein production, but with assessment of ethical uh, issues also, uh, socioeconomic impact of new standard settings and others, and science-based decision making. Here it's important that all we obtained all the knowledge obtained through science to be taken by decision making in order to improve the policy. And uh, here we need some regulation of genome engineering method or international harmonization of the policy advices related to sustainability of food system because we speak about sustainability, but we keep also food safety. Uh, building, improving transdisciplinary expertise, which, which is not so easy to be done, also to collaborate between institutions, between different kinds of organizations. And the last one, food safety related issues and sharing information and resources about communication, about uh, uh, consumer cooperation with citizen, with consumer training and education, and um, acceleration the interface between scientific advice and crisis management decision with information gathering, synthesis, and analyzing using computational tools and uh, intelligent artificial intelligence. So I speak about the platform and the benefit, for example, for uh, uh, from the uh, IT tools. Firstly, as I said, we have uh, uh, we expect to have all these kind of uh, stakeholders from food safety system, institution, food safety authorities, university, industry, uh, consumer and citizen. Uh, we can find contact, short bio, main uh, technical and scientific expertise, cross competence, roles in uh, different uh, food safety projects. So you can register as expert in our website now and uh, here you can see our um, our uh, members uh, partners members in the left part and our supporting partners mainly food safety authorities national food safety authorities from all the country but not only also research infrastructure and other uh, in organization Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia. This was very, very uh, details and insightful presentation. There are lots of questions coming up uh, for both uh, you and uh, Caroline. Yes. So what are the status of so-called plant-derived 
preservatives in today's time, like we still reply on synthetic additives uh, for food preservation. This is what is written, but I think that they want to say we still rely on synthetic additives for food preservation. Uh, probably the water replacer of uh, synthetic uh, uh, preservative, uh, the natural one, water uh, natural replace. There are also technologies. There are also not only uh, substances, but there are also substances. And I give uh, some example about technology. High pressure packaging that uh, could could uh, prolong the shelf life, or uh, uh, map technology also uh, uh, modify the atmosphere packaging. But also, what I want to say is that keeping hygiene at the production site is very important. Even if you have different kind of, uh, of technologies and preservative substances, but most important is to keep very, very uh, uh, hygienic condition in production site. And can I can give an example, a very big uh, factory here, they, they are very good uh, and they uh, have wanted to have a bread, for example, for 14 days. But they said, I don't know, uh, it keeps only seven days. And uh, we go there and we found some Maldives in, in the walls, you know, but they, they couldn't find. We, we did some uh, sanitizing uh, experiments and uh, we, keep, we found uh, that moldy in the walls. Of course, they wanted not to wash, to remove the first strait of the first layer of the wall and to put again, and then their bread uh, kept uh, 14 days. So it's important- there are lots of factors. Hygiene and, high, and what we, we saw also, personal hygiene is the most important because personal is a vector of transmitting microorganisms. So, uh, firstly, to have a very, very good hygiene and personal hygiene. And then we can have uh, uh, different kind of technologies that are available. We can find in the internet different technologies, but also some... Uh, uh, some uh, also, we can have a very simple way to spread uh, the packaging uh, material with different essential oil, of course, for some products. But there are a lot of uh, uh, technologies and processes. I cannot yeah. uh, give the example all yeah, of them now. So, how foods become cancerogenic? Probably. What? How what? food uh, how food become cancerogenic? Ah yes, for example, having mycotoxins uh, because uh, uh, sometimes we do not know uh, mycotoxin, uh, so we cannot uh, uh, so uh, if a malt is increasing because mycotoxin are producing of malts, no fungi. If uh, they are increasing, uh, grow, they grow. Uh, is possible to have, but not to have. So can be a very small increase in to produce mycotoxin and can be a, a big uh, increasing and not producing. So, but when we see molds, it's better not to eat, not to give to the animals. And even, for example, if we, if we have a jar of jam or with tomato pasta, if there, there is uh, contaminated with uh, malts uh, on the yeah. top, not remove it, uh, throw out uh, the entire because mycotoxin going five uh, centimeter, mm, probably many of uh, most of us know this, uh, but uh, uh, mycotoxin, uh, there are very dangerous. And as I, uh, I uh, show in my slides, uh, especially aflatoxin, but at the home as consumer, we don't know what it is inside. So yeah. we should be uh, careful. There are lots of questions for you. I uh, will ask one more and after that I'll include Caroline as well. Uh, so why are the US statistics for foodborne illnesses so high? Uh, was 16.7% um, compared to Europe 1%. Is it due to a different way of reporting incidents or is it more no. fundamental than that? Probably, probably, 
but uh, uh, also there are different years. Uh, uh, so uh, the information were taken uh, up from different years. Uh, I, I should uh, assure now I will look again to see if uh, uh, there are differences in, uh, but probably yes. Okay, so uh, Caroline, this is to you. Apart from Nigeria, uh, have your team uh, has trained in other countries like India or uh, Southeast Asia? Um, and uh, do you find, if you did, do you find any differences in the mindset of vendors across these countries? And uh, how do you deal with this? Do they show more interest, less interest, keen to learn, less keen to learn? So EC is operating in um, Nigeria and Ethiopia. And interestingly, we have found some differences based on our formative research in the markets where we're operating. In Nigeria, for example, the um, vendors were more organized uh, and the markets authorities were more organized. Ethiopia, we found less organization overall. Um, and, and vendors are are not uh, linked through vendor associations. Um, so it is important in doing this training to understand uh, the environment where you want to start the training. It's not one size fits all. The, the information transfer is similar between different countries. You're sharing the same set of information but how you present it should reflect the culture. Um, the other country that Eat Safe, not Eat Safe, uh, the GAIN, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, is starting vendor training in is Kenya. Um, so we are mostly right now <clears throat> working in the African region, but we do have uh, offices also uh, in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thanks. Another question for Nastasia. Thank you, Caroline. Are there studies that measure the levels of dioxin in our blood to compare across countries? And uh, there is probably a question that is uh, part of your answer. Is it possible that dioxins have contributed toward the increasing allergy levels in the populations in developed countries? I started with the second one. I think it's not related to the allergies. It's related to the cancers. But the cancers are not uh, uh, very well. I, it cannot be related only with dioxin because, you know, there are a lot of other contaminants. So uh, probably I, I do not know about a study uh, 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 that measuring uh, uh, blood uh, level of dioxin, uh, maybe there is, I do not know. But uh, in fact, dioxin starting to be more um, studied in the last year because, uh, you know, before 2000, it, not, it was not so about dioxin as contaminant, but there is a process of contamination. And uh, uh, this forest that all the time there are a lot of fires in the forest and this kind of uh, industrial activities uh, uh, lead to accumulate dioxin in the, in the, in the soil. And uh, uh, that's why uh, uh, the research in this area starting to increase in the last time. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I do not know about uh, for the first question about this study, but uh, as uh, you said, we wanted uh, in our SRIA, we even put these biomonitoring uh, contaminants uh, in, uh, for human health. Uh, we wanted to, to do this kind of study. Uh, of course, uh, it's an interesting, increasing interest now, uh, also in other uh, contaminants, because another one, uh, it seems that are coming uh, to be uh, also regulated. And uh, 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 of course, a lot of uh, uh, new knowledge we have to have in uh, food safety area. 
Yeah. Thanks, Nastasia. Caroline, another one for you. What was your criteria for the trainers in the train uh, of trainings program? Uh, how far ahead are they in food safety awareness uh, that the vendors uh, that they will train? So our train the trainers uh, program was designed to help educate the stand, the food safety or safe food stand uh, in the market. So they were trained on, um, they, uh, their training was actually quite comprehensive. And it, it uh, we also trained uh, government officials in both states as well as other leaders in like associations. So the, um, the train the trainers was really designed to be a little more comprehensive, though actually our vendor training was quite comprehensive, but a little more comprehensive, but also designed to help explain food safety to consumers. Um, so it, uh, and we did, as I noted, there were literacy level differences. Uh, the uh, consumer population in this area was a little uh, more um, more educated than the vendor population, but our trainers also were, were quite well educated. Good. And what is the advantages uh, of, to the handlers for them to attend the training? Uh, do they have certificates uh, that they can show to customers? Uh, uh, can it give them access to um, sell it more markets, uh, not only this particular one that they're in? Uh, can they charge higher prices, increase their customer base, probably the look of the, the vendor shop? Yeah, we um, the training was not actually originally an intervention in Nigeria, but it supported the brand. So vendors who participate in the training can join our uh, Absenti Fest Fest brand, uh, and there they get um, they get tablecloths, they get aprons, they get uh, displays, which shows that they have they have been in the training. That all vendors trained got certificates. Uh, and in our Ethiopia program, we're actually uh, going to be um, giving vendors as they go through training, each training, they'll get um, things like claws or things that will facilitate the the lessons that we are teaching at that particular um, training session. So um, the vendors in Nigeria did, uh, they didn't receive um, a stipend per se, but they did, I think, receive transportation money um, to get to the training. And you know, we, we've had no lack of desire for training that people uh, wanted. They definitely wanted training. And even when training was over, they asked to, for more training. So it's clearly a need that uh, needs to be filled. So the incentives were more kind of culturally uh, based. What will be, you know, appreciated from the community there. Okay, Anastasia, for you, one more question. Uh, are there any plans uh, to connect with schools and colleges uh, with this training in important part of uh, connecting with the new and emerging civil societies and uh, uh, your particular uh, plan with um, uh, Europe for uh, Food for Europe? Uh, yes, we uh, have a plan to have uh, also special courses, trainings for uh, different um, levels, levels uh, in high school uh, and in, uh, in faculties, of course, uh, bachelors or masters or PhD. Uh, especially, uh, uh, it is a big request for risk assessors, uh, for uh, faculties, uh, to starting from the faculties to understand the process. But uh, uh, food safety should be learned uh, from, uh, from uh, I don't know, childhood. I remember we have had a, a project uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, uh, food safety in children. And we have had at that time uh, people from 6 to 12, and uh, they understand what microorganisms, 
uh, are, what they are doing, bad or uh, nice things. And uh, yes, it's better to have uh, this kind of approaches because we should start with the young generation, of course. We, we are replanning this. With the little one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Caroline, uh, one last question for you. Is there an option for video online or any of this um, uh, type of education so people can access the training at times uh, uh, when they, uh, for example? That is a great question. Um, part of the, at this point, there is not a, a video option. We do send out um, reminders and text messages to vendors, um, but the, the key question is like, what kind of technology do the vendors carry? Um, yeah. Some carry none. So it's it's a matter of identifying like, is the cell phone, you know, actually a lot of the cell phones can't actually manage video. And internet, of course, is a is a big issue for these communities. So um, as things improve, the our ability to get these messages out will also improve. So I love that idea. Definitely worth taking forward. Um, I also just observed that the questions have lots of information on other people working in Nigeria. I've just yeah. noticed, yeah. so hopefully you'll send us the questions afterwards so I can capture that information. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm collecting all the emails of people that want to contact you probably will edible plastic factors uh, constantly at 37 degrees remain safe so probably this is question for both of you because it's a matter of safety and how you handle these things uh, so there are lots of uh, proposal from our audience to connect with you to work with you to have uh, projects together uh, so uh, very enthusiastic audience we have which we are very pleased to and uh, hopefully um, you know, there will be uh, lots of good things uh, that will come up uh, later uh, with uh, all of these uh, questions that people have and all of this interest. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, uh, this uh, absolutely uh, wonderful conversation that we had uh, all together. Um, so please uh, reach out, all of you that are in the audience uh, to us. Uh, we will make sure that you are in contact with uh, both uh, Caroline and Nastasia. A wonderful conversation. Thank you both, uh, Caroline Smith uh, Deval, uh, the Deputy De Director Director of It's Safe, and uh, Dr. Nastasia Belk, uh, Director General at the Nutritional R&D Institute uh, for Food uh, Bioresources at uh, Bucharest, and Associate Professor at Faculty of Biotechnologies at University of. Uh, Agronomics uh, Sciences and Veterinary Medicine at Bucharest, uh, Romania. Uh, I would like also to thank um, uh, our GHI Food Safety Training and Education Working Group, and especially Obadina Dewai and Amalia Miteliut. Uh, again, uh, thanks, uh, a huge thanks to all of you, our wonderful audience. Uh, uh, with that so many questions, I trust you enjoyed our webinar and enrich your knowledge. Uh, thanks also to our webinar team, Nicholas Stanley, our GHI Communication Director, and also Dr. Gerhard Schlenning. You can see them, uh, both of them. Uh, again, uh, I want to uh, remind you about uh, the abstract submission for our upcoming second uh, GHI World Congress on Global Food Safety and Security, stepping up the, tra the transition to the global food system to a sustainable future. Uh, we are all talking about a uh, sustainable future, safe, uh, with, without any chemical contaminants and uh, without any issues. So this is going to be held next year from 18 to 20th of March uh, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Abstract submission can be done uh, now uh, through our dedicated uh, Congress website. You can see it at the chat, which is uh, www.ghiworldcongress.org. Thank you very much for your attention and goodbye from me, Dr. Diana Bogiva. See you at our next webinar.
Till then, keep learning, smiling, stay safe, healthy, happy, and curious.